Hello? Good morning, everyone. So we have four people. Uh, let's give it a, uh, maybe a couple more minutes. I got it. If, uh, please add yourself as an attendee. Good morning, everybody. Hi. Looks like you have a nice view, Quinton. <laughs> My outdoor office when the weather is good. Yeah. Yours is even better. <laughs> Mine is in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody wants to bring up anything before we start? We start. Yeah, I was just going to mention that the um, Cube Edge uh, due diligence document has been prepared, um, and I, I still need to go through it and just make sure that it's complete and uh, accurate. Um, but I'm happy for the members of the SIG to take a look at it in parallel. Um, my plan is to uh, make sure that everything's in order there and then open it up for public comment, hopefully next week. Sounds great. Yeah. I can put the link in the, in the meeting notes. Sure. Okay. All right, looks like uh, we don't have that many people today, but uh, we got Dan. So, how are you doing, Dan? Good, yeah, nice to meet you. Or, nice, I know I've met you you before, uh, Rico, but uh, nice to meet you again. Again, yeah. Um, and nice to meet uh, Quentin and Eric, I guess. Hello. Likewise. All right, you want to get started? Uh, this presentation actually gets recorded, so. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, let me uh, let me share share some mm -hmm. slides then. Okay. Uh, can you see it? Yep. Okay. Um, great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Thank you for for <laughs> asking me to uh, to talk and and for the interest in the, the work that we've been doing. Um, so, uh, a little bit think, about uh, myself. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to mention if you if you have um, dual screens, I think you might be sharing the presentation. Not not the presentation screen. How's that? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about some of the some of the research work that we've been doing at, at IBM Research around, um, you know, uh, I guess I guess secure containers is is 
how we refer to it lately, but um, uh, mostly this has to do with isolation between containers and especially kind of uh, how virtualization fits into that picture. Um, okay, let me see. Okay, so just a little bit about me. Um, so I'm a research staff member at IBM. Um, so uh, it's just outside New York City. I've been there for about 10 years now. Um, and uh, my research is mainly on operating systems, virtualization, and security in a cloud setting, which I guess is why, uh, <laughs> why it fits into this, this topic. Um, the past few years, I've been working on uh, unikernels, um, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, and more recently, sort of how to take some of the things that we uh, learned in the unikernel work and apply them to the broader container landscape in some way to help containers become more secure. Um, so yeah, so I thought I'd just like kind of jump in um, and, you know, please uh, feel free to just stop me or, or any, at any time. Um, so, so, okay. Yeah. So uh, I know I don't need to tell this audience um, <laughs> that containers are great. Uh, this is, um, this is something that, uh, you know, sometimes depending on where, where I'm talking to, um, we need to, to talk about, but I don't know about you, but um, in terms of containers, I think that a lot of the benefits of them are really, really obvious when you're doing a lot of development. So things like uh, their lightweight characteristics, how quickly they can start, how you can easily kind of manage the images. Um, especially for me when I, when I'm building things like, so if I have a project that I want to build, um, I, I love using containers to do that, to re reproduce the environment whenever I want. And, um, you know, I think this is, uh, without a doubt, uh, a huge uh, advantage, um, that containers have brought. Um, and I also know that this, this group that I'm talking to now, uh, is, uh, <laughs> perhaps, um, one that also asks this question, which is, okay, so if containers are great for a lot of this packaging stuff and a lot of the sort of, um, you know, some of these build cases and, and things like that, are they also a good, uh, a good candidate for the unit of execution that we might use um, for, you know, uh, bigger software deployments? Um, so a lot of these lightweight performance characteristics that they have are really attractive for that, right? So like the fact that they start up so quickly, the fact that they uh, can share, you know, uh, share pages in the host for memory density, all this type of stuff is, um, sounds very attractive um, in terms of a, a runtime, you know, a unit of execution. Um, also, of course, the, there's that giant uh, tooling and orchestration ecosystem that, that exists, which, you know, uh, without a doubt is um, super valuable. Um, I know that there's those CNCF uh, landscape pictures with like the bajillion icons every, <laughs> everywhere. Um, so <laughs> so uh, it seems like those are, those are all really great. Um, However, one, one thing has sort of uh, been, I guess, a, a thorn in the side of containers um, from a runtime perspective um, for a while, which is the uh, attack surface to the host. So um, this, this kind of stems from the level of abstraction that the applications uh, within the containers are using to talk to the host. They have the full, um, you know, 350 plus system calls in Linux that they can sort of poke around at and, uh, and look for vulnerabilities and other things. Um, the good news though, is that we know how to reduce when we have a large attack surface like this, we know some basic uh, approaches that we can use to reduce the attack surface. Um, namely, uh, if you take that kind of shared uh, functionality that's super highly privileged because it's in the kernel, and you reduce the privilege of it somehow, and you unshare it, so not everybody has it anymore, then you effectively get a much thinner interface. And of course, the most kind of familiar way to do this is, uh, is through virtualization. Um, you basically take, uh, so the way that I'm <laughs> positioning virtualization in this, the way, the way that I'm thinking about it is that you're essentially taking kernel functionality that was highly privileged 
and you're running it in a, in a less privileged mode um, in a virtual machine. So a guest kernel, for example, is a less privileged way of implementing the stuff that the, that the, uh, that the um, host uh, kernel may have implemented. So for example, uh, the network stack is now running in the guest and that's uh, less privileged. Uh, it's running in a less privileged mode than, than it would be with, with the host, same with the file system, same with a lot of things. Um, so this basic idea, this way of thinking about virtualization as, as a deprivileging and an unsharing to reduce the attack surface, um, I think this has been recognized generally in, in the context of containers and, and tried, to be, tried to be applied to containers to uh, reduce the attack surface that they have. So things like CATA containers, for example, are attempts to take uh, virtual machines, virtualization technology, and do exactly that, right? Uh, reduce the interface, uh, the attack interface, um, in, thereby increasing the isolation of the containers. But there are also other approaches that do the same, you know, the same abstract thing of deprivileging and unsharing. Um, for example, things like GVisor would have a user space kernel. So in some sense, the, the sentry in GVisor would be um, sort of a way of taking some of this functionality that would be in the kernel and implementing it in a less privileged way. Uh, you could imagine doing something similar with user mode Linux or something like that. Um, and uh, that's, another, that, that's another way to do it. Um, <clears throat> the third way, uh, the third thing I have, the third bullet I have here, which is another kind of instance of this idea of deprivileging and unsharing kernel functionality is um, the library OS or the unikernel approach. Um, and this is something that we looked at um, pretty heavily for a while um, because uh, uh, we, we looked at it because um, I don't know how familiar you are with unikernels. In the next slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, but unikernels have this philosophy of being only what you need. They're, they're these virtual machines with only what you need inside of them, which um, comes along with all this like kind of lightweight characteristics. So what we did uh, in the past couple of years, um, some of the, the previous work that we had was to try to take these unikernel ideas and apply them directly into uh, containers and um, the Nabla containers um, were our effort to do so. So just a little bit uh, more about unikernels. Um, so one way to think about unikernels is that they're just like virtual machines, except instead of having a uh, guest kernel inside, it's just an application linked with only those library OS components that the application needs in order to perform whatever its task is. Um, so again, you can think of them as VMs with the smallest possible thing inside of them. Um, that it's almost like the application runs directly on a virtual hardware abstraction or a virtual hardware-like abstraction. Um, typically, these things are single process, single CPU, uh, etc. Um, the first unikernels that sort of came out and started to get a lot of attention were uh, language specific. So, in particular, Mirage OS, um, which was uh, all based in OCaml. Um, uh, it was basically an OCaml runtime that ran directly on the Zen, uh, the Zen Dom U, uh, which is the guest in Zen. Um, and everything inside was OCaml, um, which was great, except um, perhaps there weren't that many uh, uh, OCaml programs there uh, around. Uh, and maybe not everybody wants to rewrite everything in OCaml at that time. Uh, maybe they still don't. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the ideas in it were, were, were very interesting. And, and I think a lot, of, a lot of people sort of jumped on this and, and started to think about how to support more things in the, the unikernel case. Um, and so several leg, more legacy-oriented unikernels came about. Uh, one of them was called Rumpfrun, um, which is based on NetBSD. So you can think of that as a virtual machine that where... Uh, you have your application and you stick in a NetBSD kernel um, straight in there uh, instead of the guest, you know, the traditional guest, guest kernel and just link it with the application. Um, other ones like Hermitux and OSV uh, even go so far as to claim binary compatibility with Linux. 
Um, in the case of Hermitux and OSV, the uh, kernels are sort of uh, written from scratch. They're not reusing uh, uh, legacy kernels like Rumplin does. So, um, so anyway, uh, so unikernels, uni just to sort of like uh, wrap this up a little bit, unikernels are, just think of them as these tiny little, uh, you know, tiny little, um, you know, super compact virtual machines. When uh, we, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if I can uh, interrupt with a quick question about the previous slide. Yes, uh, yes. So, so does this approach, uh, the unicorn approach, does it fundamentally prevent uh, multi-process, you know, containers essentially? So, so a typical application has, you know, a bunch of uh, related processes running on the same machine. Um, is is that not possible with unikernels, or would would they? Can they share this library? You know, if they, assume these are friendly processes that don't need to be, you know, that isolated from each other, uh, but they do need to run, you know, in the same environment. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, uh, I think the answer to that question is is really like depending on how strict you are adhering to the unikernel religion. Um, I think if you if you adhere very strictly. Then um, you're you're absolutely right. The the running multiple processes and having um, you know having containers that have multiple processes in are a challenge. Uh, it meaning that it will will not work. So things like um, Rump Run, for example, does not support fork in a normal way, um, and you know this can lead to all sorts of uh, generality problems, um, which actually is uh, kind of the the subject so that's a, a nice kind of <laughs> segue until until what what i'm going to talk about next so um and that is a key uh that is a key point um not just the multi-process part but but other things as well um so uh let's keep that question also in the back of uh, in the back of your mind as, as i go forward through the other stuff because this is uh this comment that you made is is really hitting the nail on the head so uh, a lot of the stuff that we're doing later on will um, will also kind of address that to some to some sense. So um, right, so so taking the unikernel, taking taking a lot of the kind of advances in the unikernel thing uh, fields. So the unikernels were demonstrating really great lightweight performance characteristics and things like that. Um, especially when you start thinking about function as a service, uh, especially like you know, the more kind of limited the uh, execution environment is, the more something like a unikernel seems like it could be a great fit. Um, so, uh, you know, when you think about more general containers, things like running multiple processes um, start to, you know, start to be <laughs> obviously pretty big concerns, but um, there, I don't want to, I don't want to say that there's no no place where uh, having a restrictive computing computing model like that makes sense because I, I think there's there still maybe some models. Um, anyway, so so we took the we took the unikernel stuff and we tried to apply it to containers as best we could. Um, and with the Nab the Nabla container things were based on Rumprun, um, which was one of the legacy based uh, unikernels. And what we sort of, I'm not gonna to talk too much about the Nava containers uh, today, but what we sort of learned through this process um, was that, uh, you know, the virtual, the virtual machine-like characteristics um, or the virtualization-like characteristics, um, they didn't really get in the way of these lightweight things. We could achieve very lightweight properties uh, even though these things were these little virtual machines. So even though virtual machines had a very kind of heavyweight connotation at the time, uh, less so these days, um, they, uh, um, you know, you know, we, we we found that that amount of things. But as as you you uh, you know already recognized, it, it was at a high cost, right? The thing we were paying a lot for it, and that was mostly through generality. So the question that we that we started to ask was can we run more like normal Linux applications on, on these things in some way? Um, and so the, the 
content or the thing that I want to talk about today is, is mainly about that, which is, can we take some of these unikernel like uh, philosophies or lessons that we learned from, from doing the Naba container stuff and apply it directly to normal Linux virtual machines? And that's, uh, that's sort of the subject of this talk. So um, the, the project that we, that we worked on is called Lupine Linux, so it's a Linux and unikernel clothing. And the basic idea here that we were trying to do is we were trying to take a normal Linux VM and make it as unikernel like as possible so that, you know, any sort of distinction about whether or not this was a, you know, a, 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 a traditional virtual machine or a library OS or a user space OS or any of those deprivileging ways I said, kind of, kind of take that out of the equation and say, can we with a normal virtual machine get the properties that the unikernels were getting. Um, <clears throat> right, so if you look at the virtual machines, I mentioned that that there's, you know, at, at some point there was sort of a big, um, a, a lot of uh, um, kind of, uh, I guess, neg neg negativity around, <laughs> around virtual machines for a while about them being very heavyweight. Um, and this is something that's, that's sort of started to be challenged. So um, for one, the monitor process. So the, this is, this is uh, I'm just depicting the virtualization stack over here with the host kernel, the monitor process, which would be saying like QMU in a traditional virtualization uh, setting, and then the, uh, the guest. Um, uh, the, the monitor process, has started to change. And so maybe most famously, uh, Firecracker, um, is AWS Firecracker is something where they, they really reduced um, the kind of uh, functionality in some sense, the, the complexity of it, the amount that it emulates when it tries to make this virtual machine abstraction specifically so that it could have more lightweight characteristics. Um, since then, the same types of things have started happening to QMU too. So that's one piece of the puzzle. If you want VMs that seem lightweight, the monitor uh, is, is one thing that can become more lightweight and people have indeed started to do that. The second piece of the puzzle though is also the guest. So, and people have done this also to, to various degrees. So you can think about um, in the user space of your containers, for example, people talk about running Ubuntu containers versus Alpine containers, the latter being lighter weight than, than the former. Down at the guest kernel level, if you're talking about virtualization, um, the people have looks at different kernel configuration options. Um, there's a project called TinyX. Um, there was also, if you look at the Firecracker, uh, the micro VM configuration, this is also a reduction in terms of what the guest kernel is going to do. And of course, the unikernels that we talked about before are almost the extreme form of this thin guest um, with, with only what you need. And so, as we, uh, I, might, I might not have said all these things that were great about unikernels, but um, <laughs> a lot of the things that the unikernels were boasting with their, uh, their particular um, design were things like very small kernel sizes, very fast boot times, great performance and security benefits from kind of not having a lot of stuff that you don't need in there. So it's like almost a, a uh, um, get rid of potential vulnerabilities that may be there type thing, uh, reduce the attack surface. Um, however, as we said, um, they suffer in particular because of this, this lack of the Linux support. So just to give you a little bit more detail about some of these things. So Hermitux and OSV are two of the unikernels that claim binary compatibility with Linux. Um, there's a bit of a caveat there with that binary compatibility uh, claim. For example, Hermitux supports 97 system calls, um, which is not the full Linux thing. So if your application is requiring more system calls, um, you're, you're a little out of luck there. Um, OSV, on the other hand, has a, has a whole, whole list of, of uh, kind of caveats that might happen. So if your application isn't compiled with PIE, if your application uses TLS, if uh, your application is statically linked, um, if your application does fork or exec, uh, and, and a, a number of other things are, are kind of like little, little caveats that, that make OSV difficult to use. Um, 
in general, what happens is that the, uh, the communities behind these unikernels end up curating applications. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's a difficult process to keep all those applications uh, curated. So, um, what we really set out to do is just to see if we could match a lot of the performance from these unikernels just using Linux, um, a, a, a kind of a, a quote unquote normal Linux VM to see if we could do this. Um, and so just uh, the spoiler alert is, is that we, we, we could succeed in doing this. Um, so here are some statistics that I'll go through a little bit more uh, in a few minutes, but um, you know, we could have a, a small image size, four megabytes, boot time of 23 milliseconds, and up to 33% higher throughput than the micro VM, which was from Firecracker. But I'll go into those a little bit more. Okay, so, so basically what I'm planning to talk about is I'm going to talk about this Lupine Linux that we worked on, um, which is basically taking your application uh, or basically what it does is it takes this guest and it applies a couple of what we call unikernel like techniques to it. One of them is specialization, um, which we do through kernel configuration. And the second one is system call overhead elimination, um, which, which basically means, you know, when in a library OS, instead of system calls, you get to use regular calls, which tends to have a performance or it has at least the, uh, you know, the belief that this will improve performance dramatically. Um, so we also do that to Linux uh, through an existing patch, which is called KML, which I'll also talk about. And I'll show how, how we put it all together and, um, and we, how we got those numbers that I, that I mentioned. Okay, so first specialization. So um, if you think about the, the unikernels and like what, what is sort of the, the primary way that they uh, they're getting the, the, the primary kind of philosophy that they're organized around. It is, it is really specialization. So um, they only include what is needed for the application that is, that is going to run. And that's, that's by design. Um, so if you look at, if you look at Linux, it, it's, it's a very general system. It's not, um, it's not typically used to specialize for a particular application. Um, however, it is extremely configurable. So, um, if you're familiar with Linux, you'll recognize this uh, menu config uh, screenshot here. Um, there's about um, 16,000 options in the, in the K config, um, maybe more. I think there's more at this point. Um, it's always increasing. Lots of them are for drivers, file systems, processor features, um, but also a lot more stuff. So what we started to do is we started to think, can we use that, that kernel specialization that is already existing in Linux to kind of tailor the kernel for whatever application we want in the same way that a unikernel would tailor its library OS for a particular application. So um, what this picture here is showing is how we broke down all the configuration options um, and thought about them in terms of making a Linux kernel uh, that would be specialized to a particular application. So we started with an already pretty specialized kernel configuration, which was the micro VM uh, configuration that comes with Firecracker. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of how many configuration options, so these numbers are that, that are shown have to do with whether something is uh, selected as config, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, micro VM, there's basically 833 configuration options which have been selected as yes. The vast majority of these other ones are things like drivers. Um, so cutting down to that, to that much um, isn't, uh, it should, shouldn't be too much of a shock. Inside those 833 options, we then looked inside uh, and we determined which ones we had to have, so which ones were required for any application to be able to run it as a, as a VM. And uh, we basically selected 283 that we just had to have to boot our, to boot our, our things. So that's about 34% of them. The other ones we, um, we classified as not 
not necessarily not necessary for for so they may not be necessary for every application so and we split that group again into things that some applications may need and then other things that didn't really fit the unikernel model so things like multi-processing and hardware management but to that question that you asked um so even though we're kind of highlighting these things and taking them out now um later on we start we started to have a look at what happens when you put them back in because once you're in a standard linux environment you can start you know this isn't a this is no longer a um it's no longer a very black and white choice it becomes a very slippery slope so what we wanted to do here is get something that's as much um as, as unikernel like as possible and then see how how we could sort of uh you know change change that uh or how how it would degrade over time and so i'll get to that a little bit later Dan, just just a quick clarification of of your numbers here so yeah so if i understand correctly so the sixteen thousand linux configurations options that you can turn on basically uh, yeah. of which you took five percent of them uh and then you trimmed that down you took 34 percent of five percent uh, and then you identified that, I guess that's 44% of those are, are actually kind of fundamentally useful to everything, multiprocessing and hardware management. And the other, so, so you're down to 44% uh, of 34% of 5% of 16,000. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, n not quite. So, so the, the multiprocessing and the hardware management, we said, um, these don't match the unikernel thing. So if you if you're interested in running unikernels um, for whatever reason, you don't need those because it doesn't it doesn't match your model. Furthermore, you may not need any of that that fifty percent fifty six percent of sixty six percent of five percent, um, which is the the uh, those three hundred and eleven applications to specific options. And I'll, yeah. I'll go a little bit more into detail now about about what each one of those categories are and, and why we categorized it that way. Um, the idea is that if you have a unikernel that does require them, you would put them back in. Um, but we think that the multiprocessing and the hardware management, any unikernel that you have is not going to require those. This is, this is our sort of assertion here. Okay, so, um, so, application, so just to give you a sense of what the application specific options are. Um, so a very kind of straightforward example is uh, some kernel configuration options um, toggle whether or not a system call is is present in the kernel so here are a list of uh various config options like uh you know config advise syscalls if you implement if you configure your kernel with them you will get an implementation for m advise and f advise 64. Um, depending on your application you may not need those similarly with with a lot of these other system calls um, you may not need them. Some of them you'll notice are ones that you pretty much always need, like Futex, um, <laughs> for example. Um, but nevertheless, uh, though that, that is one kind of class of, of application-specific options that we took out. Um, the, other, the other type of ones are you might have an application that does not use PROC at all or, or SysControl. Sys Was there a question? Oh, um, okay, so, uh, so if, if they don't use various kernel services, then, um, you know, you can kind of just uh, not put those in if you want to. Similarly, there's a bunch of library functions that may be in the, in, in the, in the kernel library, as well as debugging and information type of functions. So these are the types of things that we classified as these application specific options. So every time you want to run a application as a unikernel, you would select a certain number of these for the application that you were trying to run. Um, the other ones, the, these are the other two categories that, that we mentioned. Um, so these are the multi-process ones. So there's a bunch of features in the kernel that go away from that. Um, if you think about the unikernel trust model, um, that thing inside the guest is kind of all one thing. Unikernels are used to having that linked together. So there's absolutely no protection between the two of them. Um, so a lot of things like C groups, namespaces, SE Linux, SecComp, 
you know, kernel page table isolation. Some of these are very expensive, but if your if your model has them all in the same trust domain, um, you may not need them. Um, uh, yeah. So that that and and that's an important point that, that I'm going to come back to a little bit later. Um, okay. So the question um, comes up very quickly, which is how do you get that application specific kernel configuration? Um, because the, you know, uh, your, how do you know what your application is going to use? And we don't have a great answer for this. This is a, this is quite a hard problem. So for what we did, you know, again, we're trying to find the lightest weight, most specialized thing that we can to show that it's not, you don't need to throw out, like the point here is that you don't need to throw out Linux. Um, what we, what we did is basically manual trial and error. So we would run our application with this configuration, these 283 options, which are called Lupine base, and see what happened. And if it didn't work, then we would put something else in. Um, this is admittedly a terrible, terrible, uh, time-consuming, <laughs> soul-destroying process. Um, uh, you know, it's like, like many things, you get a little faster at it the more you do. Um, but this is something that um, we want to, this is, this is sort of an open question about how you can figure out these types of things automatically. Um, okay, so just real quick, I want to mention the system call overhead elimination. Because uh, so, that, that, yeah, question. Can I just go back to the previous slide quickly? Yeah. Um, so, so is it uh, this, this, alternative to manual trial and error is it, is it not as simple as, as just like instrumenting the application and figuring out which system calls it triggers uh so yeah so so that's a little bit more complicated than than it it seems right um so depending on your application um it may it may load some library that will do some more system calls some execution um, paths may not be uh, may not be triggered in whatever test you're doing. So we had a couple things that we had to do. We had to figure out what like the the sort of success criteria, what the what the test is, what the load on the application should be, um, so that we would have a representative um, run of that application. Um, then once we had that, we'd have to have to figure out. We, so we could certainly ask trace that we get all the system calls. Um, some of these other things that were not syscall based, um, sometimes it would break. So if we took out talk support, for example, an application in some execution path decided it needed to look in proc, then um, that would be something that we wouldn't we wouldn't get with S trace, for example. Um, do you, do you know what I mean? Like it's it, it ends up being like a fair because because you don't have a ground truth of everything that this application will ever do. Um, uh, because that doesn't exist, it's difficult to sort of do this in an automated way. And, okay. and, but, but, but it sort of boils down to kind of test coverage kind of problems as opposed to something more fundamental than that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but uh, I, guess, I guess another thing to say is like, uh, if you're familiar with um, putting set comp policies on applications, um, this is a very similar problem. So uh, set comp, you know, set comp is a sort of, it can be used as a way to uh, specify system calls that can be allowed or denied. Um, and by doing that, um, sometimes you deny a system call that some execution path will use, which is again, is a test, test coverage issue. Um, in general, I think what happens is you end up with more permissive, more conservative um, policies. Uh, it seems possible that perhaps some kind of, um, static analysis type things could also help here. Um, but in, in general, I think uh, I th you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's not, this is not like particularly a new or a different problem. Um, I think it's a, a problem that comes up a lot, which is just coming up again. <laughs> you know, like whether it's like test coverage or, or a set comp or whatever it is. Okay. I, I didn't mean to rattle. I was just curious if there was more to it than that, but, but I understand. Thanks for the answer. It was very comprehensive. Okay, great. So, um, right, so, so we're gonna use this specialization of the, of the configuration and we're gonna apply this to our 
our Linux kernel that is in our guest. And this is something that we think is going to give us a only what you need, uh, quote unquote, unikernel that is really just a VM. Um, the second piece that we want to do is we want to eliminate the system call. Uh, we want to eliminate the system call overhead uh, in the same way that you would get if you were running as a library operating system. Um, so I had mentioned that um, there was a uh, patch to Linux, which allows you to run an application in kernel mode. Uh, it's called kernel mode Linux. And um, basically, what it does is it allows applications to be running in, you know, <laughs> in, in kernel mode so that, the, so that the system calls can be replaced with just regular calls. Um, so the patch exists. It's, um, it's not upstream, though. Um, it certainly is not safe unless you're in a, uh, you know, in a uh, kind of single trust environment. Um, and unfortunately, it's only being ported up to a Linux 4.0. Um, but, but it exists. And so it gave us a good way to sort of um, experiment with this without, without needing to do a lot of work. Um, just so you can see how this changes um, the, uh, the, the, the system calls. Um, we made some small changes to the libc. Uh, this is muscle libc. And you see that we are basically calling uh, instead of system, instead of calling the syscall, we call to a particular location which is exposed by the kernel. Um, the applications themselves, uh, when when Linux starts the application, it does not put the processor into a user mode. Um, this all also, it's, a, it's just, just so we're totally clear on this, this also uh, predated the kernel page table isolation. So um, the user and the kernel, the user and the kernel were already in the same address space. So they're, they're in the same MM, the same address space. So the only thing that really was happening anyway in those kernels was the um, was the switch of processor mode. And that is what has been removed here. Um, to, to use this, uh, we had to relink uh, if we had static binaries, um, or we could dynamically link our version of the libc. Um, either way, this is less invasive than the build modifications for unikernel. Um, and uh, this allows us to see what the, what the benefits of doing so is. Sorry, Dan. Quick interruption again. Um, yeah. Maybe I missed something fundamental, but but by putting the application in kernel mode in the CPU, surely you just ruined all your isolation stroke security problems. Within so this is within the guest. So oh. um, so yeah, the the isolation boundary now is just so we basically we have totally removed that isolation boundary that was within the guest. So, okay. yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so to put this all together, we started off, we got the Linux kernel, <laughs> the Linux kernel source, and we have some unmodified app that we want to run with some libraries. The first step that we had was, was the specialization. So the way we do that is we somehow get a application-specific loopline configuration. And so this is that process, this manual process, which, you know, this horrible process, which hopefully would be somehow better. Um, then we also do the system call uh, overhead elimination, which basically means patching the kernel and patching the libc. Um, from that, we can get a application-specific kernel image that's going to be our guest kernel image. But we still don't have enough to, this still isn't quite enough to run our application because normally what you have when you run a virtual machine is you have a kernel image and then you have the, the application you want to run, the program you want to run, all of its libraries, which are normally in a root file system for Linux. But for this, what we do is we leverage the existing container images, which are already, in some sense, they're already root file systems. So they contain both the application and the necessary libraries that we need, and they're conveniently all packaged together already for us. Um, there's one more thing, though, which is how the application is supposed to start. So um, and a lot of times, you know, your, your application might need 
the network to be initialized or something like that. So there are initialization scripts, which we don't necessarily run here, um, but uh, those can be application specific. So if, you, if your application does not require uh, the network or the disk or proc or whatever, you might not need the initialization script for those. Um, so that's another piece that we're gonna add to the picture here. So we're gonna take the container image, which has all that stuff, but then we're also gonna put in an application specific startup script. Um, and in, in this case, we're getting this by hand again. Um, it's possible that depending on, depending on whether or not you have a way to automatically generate the application specific loopline configuration, you could potentially also do the same for, uh, for the startup script, because this is basically like, if you select this option, then you're gonna have to set up, you know, if you select networking, you're gonna have to set up the network, uh, that type of thing. Anyway, after getting that, we can take all those files from the, from the container image, the startup script, et cetera, and create a lupine root FS now. So now we have the kernel image and the root file system, which can be run by a normal monitor, such as Firecracker. Well, not that Firecracker is a super normal monitor, but this could be run by QMU or, or Firecracker or something. In our case, because we were going for lightweight, we went with Firecracker. So given all that that we saw, then we, we ran some experiments to see if we could start to match the performance that we were getting from, from, the, from, the, uh, from the unikernels. So we, we, we used basically a, just a single machine here um, with, with Firecracker. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to point out was that uh, for these experiments, we're using a fairly old version of Linux just because we wanted to use the KML patches and evaluate those. So this is Linux 4.0 that we're using for these. Hey Dan, so yep. uh, uh, time check. So there's like uh, 12 minutes left and before the okay. hour. So yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, so I'll, uh, I, won't, I won't spend too, too long on these. Um, so there's a couple interesting ones that, that came up. So the first thing we looked at was the configuration diversity. So how, how much this application specific configuration actually manifested for a bunch of applications that we tried. So we took the top 20 popular applications on Docker Hub and we went through this manual process of finding out what their application specific configuration was. Um, and what we found, so this graph here, uh, the X axis is the, the number, it, it's the, the support for the X number of uh, top apps. And then the Y axis is the number of configuration options. So it's kind of a union of all the options that was necessary to run all of those top X applications. And so what you see is, you know, when you get to 20, um, you only need 19 configuration options in addition to Lupine Base. This is um, in order to run those, app those 20 applications, um, which was fairly low, which surprised us a little bit. Um, and the other thing about that though, is that if you look, 13, <laughs> Supporting the top 13 app applications required the same amount of support as the top 20. Um, we only did 20 because again, this is like a, this was a manual process for us. Um, but, um, you know, this kind of gave us a, a sense that maybe there's a more general configuration that doesn't need to be specified per application that we could use. And we called the one which has all those 19 option, options in the evaluation, we call that one Lupine General. So, the special configurations we have, we have Lupine base, we have loop, I think what we call Lupine is the application specific one, and then Lupine general, which is the one with this configuration that has all of these 19 configuration options. So just, just to be clear, Dan, so, so those are the same 19 configuration options that cover all of those applications, or each one has 19 unique no, this is, this is, so this, this graph is showing the, un, the union of all those op options. So uh, it may, so all 20 of the top applications can be run with this same configuration, which is, okay. has 19 options in it. Okay. Um, this, this table, which I know is quite small over here, um, this has the actual number that we found for each one of them. So if you see like, you know, um, some of them require, the most it looks like is 13. Uh, and some of them require zero. 
um, in addition to the loop line based again. So this says pretty much that with 18 options, you can run, uh, yeah, the 20, the 20 applications, right? Yeah, yeah, the 19 options, yeah. So, I mean, so in some sense, this is a little bit promising because, you know, uh, the application specific, uh, that, that has all those issues that have to do with like state exploration and, you know, coverage and, and all that stuff, which are, which are difficult problems. Um, if there is something general that, you know, that we feel com confident supports a lot of things, this would be much easier to, uh, for people to sort of get behind. But that question of whether or not it's, it's general enough is always going to be there. Um, so I'm just going to, like in the interest of time, I'm just going to go through these pretty quick. So, you know, we basically measured the, the kernel image size. The thing that I, I want to bring out of this, so micro VM, in, in all these graphs that I'm going to show, uh, micro VM is sort of the baseline that we use, which is the, the default configuration that comes with Firecracker. And again, that's already been specialized to some degree by the Firecracker team. Um, the RUMP, OSV, and Hermitux, those are the three unikernels that are, that are legacy compatible in some ways, um, uh, legacy compatible in quotations. Um, and then we keep showing Lupine and Lupine General. Lupine in this case being um, for Hello World and Lupine General being that one with the 19 options. And uh, a theme that you're gonna see is that Lupine and Lupine General tend not to be too far apart in most of these metrics. And also, they tend to be very comparable with, with what we see for the unikernels. Um, so in this case, Hermitux is the smallest, OSV and RUMP are, are slightly bigger. Um, I believe this is because OSV and RUMP are a little bit more uh, extensive in their support than, than Hermitux is. So if Hermitux evolves um, to support more things, it probably will start looking more like OSV and RUMP. Um, <clears throat> in any case, Lupine is uh, kind of um, it's, it's, it's competitive with them in image size. A similar story happens with boot time. Um, you know, here you see that we're actually getting better performance than, than, than some of them. Um, although there are various, there are various configurations on the unikernels which really change, um, change their performance. So like OSV, for example, we read the literature and it said sub 10 millisecond boot up time. Um, and we, when we ran it, we were getting, um, you know, 50 milliseconds or something. And when we looked into it, it had to do with the file system choice. If you change it to a read-only file system, you can get sub 10 millisecond. Um, <clears throat> but again, I think the overall story to say here is that the lupine is kind of in the same ballpark as these unikernels, even lupine general. Um, memory footprint is another one. Uh, you know, again, similar story here. Um, system call latency. This is this is this one gets a little bit more interesting because this is where we start to see uh, the benefits of having that KML patch. So um, if you look here, we have Lupine, no KML, and Lupine that we're comparing against. So this is the advantage that you get by running uh, without that processor mode switch uh, for system calls. Um, and again, like comparing to the unikernels, um, it's very comparable. It, it, it's better in, in some cases. This is a system call latency microbenchmark. So a system call latency microbenchmark is actually the best case for this kernel mode Linux for, for this overhead elimination. Um, but that KML benefit, it goes away very quickly. So if you have stuff that, that's happening in between your system calls, uh, that tends to amortize the benefit that you're going to get. <clears throat> so this is another interesting one. We're very limited, by the way, in what, what we can use to, to evaluate these things, mostly by what you can run in the unikernels. But here, what we end up with is 33% um, advantage over micro VM. And uh, having looked a little bit more into this, we think that this is because a lot of those security options like the kernel page table isolation or, or secomp or things like this that are fairly expensive, if you have a single trust domain, they can be removed, um, which gives you some, some, more, um, some more performance. <laughs> Takeaways. Um, so specialization of the guest kernel seems very important. Um, we saw big improvements even over micro VM, which is fairly 
uh, you know, has some degree of specialization already. However, it does seem like specialization per application may not be super important. So this is the difference between Lupine General and Lupine. Um, so, you know, whether or not it's worth going and figuring out how to solve all these, you know, how do I get the smallest possible thing for this application may not be worth it. Um, the other thing is that the KML patch, it may not be worth it to try to port that to a new version of Linux because the uh, advantage that you get is relatively small. Um, uh, so for us, it was a bit, uh, surprisingly small, um, especially because when you start looking at micro benchmarks, or macro benchmarks, you get um, very little overhead. Um, and I guess the other, the other takeaway here is just that by using Linux, a lot of these common problems that you have about not being able to support applications just go away. Um, and to, to this point that we made before, um, you know, this is, this is a really important point, which is that Lupine is still Linux. And so you get like sort of a great graceful degradation. You can have a graceful degradation of these properties. If you decide that you want to have multiple processes in there, fork is not going to crash your unit kernel in this case, um, like it would in other, other unit kernels. If you decide that you, uh, and you know, when we started measuring these things, adding in separate processes, especially if they're control processes that don't have high context switch rates, it has virtually no overhead that we could measure. Um, when we started looking into running multiple processors on these things, which also is not typically supported in a lot of the uni kernels, these also have uh, fairly low overhead. So again, it's, it becomes a sort of a slippery slope, but you have some, some choice there. Uh, I'm gonna fly through it because I'm out of time, but uh, there's a bunch of, uh, of benefits. I'm not trying to say that unikernels are not good for anything. That's not what I'm trying to say here. There are benefits that, that do not compare. Um, Language-based uh, uh, unicorn benefits, especially um, when you get to use the language, you get a lot of benefits from that. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I got to stop there, unfortunately. But um, the next bit I wanted to talk about <laughs> was how to get this into the container ecosystem. Um, but, uh, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, so I think there's a question from uh, uh, Quentin. Uh, you, uh, is the plan to, you know, longer term to donate some of this work to the CNCF? Or yeah, so, project? so what we're looking at now, and so like, I'll, I'll just kind of give it a little teaser, this next piece that we're working on now. So, um, what we want to do is like, so we, we think that there's a big advantage in having a lighter weight guest in some of these micro VM type approaches to containers. So CATA containers or, um, or something like that. Um, what we're trying to look at is this tension between, um, it, we were trying to look at how, how pods fit into the picture because some of these things that we were talking about here, some of the benefits that we're getting have to do with getting rid of that trust domain inside the guest. So, you know, you asked about like, are you throwing away all the protections in the, inside the guest? That's okay to throw away if everything is in the same trust domain. Once you have a pod with sidecars that may not be in the same trust domain or agents that may not be in the same trust domain, that, that gets a little bit more tricky. So we're trying to figure out what, how, you know, really the question is how, how this can apply in the context of pods. And I think if we get a good grasp on that, then I think that, that we can get this into uh, we can we can get we can get into a position where this will be a lot more interesting to the community. That that's our that's our goal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's uh, so Quentin said that uh, he needs to drop off. But uh, yeah, do you want to do a follow up presentation on the container D? Um, uh, in and how how uh, we can work together with the container D community. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we need, a, we, we probably need a little bit more time to, um, you know, to, to get some of the, the initial experimentation to see if, uh, to see how, how this stuff yeah. works. Um, but in the future, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, we'd love to. Yeah. Sounds great. I think, uh, yeah, I think this is really useful and I think, uh, um, it can be, uh, it can be used as a replacement for some of the run times or the, like the, like the um, kata containers, but they're using, a, a, you know, their own kernel and then maybe they might be able to use a, 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 a you know, strip down kernel for, for these applications and, and to improve performance. Yeah, yes, yeah, certainly like, uh, 
sort of a, you know, a, a easy target would be to say, if we, if we could say like, hey, in your kernel, can you put these things into your configuration? Um, the problem that we're having now is that we're not sure if the agent design or the, the, the fact that you have the agent inside the guest in the way that you do and the way that, that um, the pods are supported, we don't know the impacts on that on a lot of these uh, specialization plans that we have. And that's what we're currently looking into. Yeah. Yeah. So I think once we have the answers to those questions, then we'll be able to much easier go to the CATA community and say, Hey, um, you know, here's a simple way to get, get a bunch of lightweight performance. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I think they're working on, on an agent that is lighter weight too, with, uh, to have an agent in rust. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw that. Um, I, th I think it's really cool. Um, f f part of part of what I would like to be able to do is identify um, when when it when it means what it means to the kernel configuration, for example, when you say this is lighter weight, because really like um, taking out code, sometimes it means that you need less things from the kernel. Sometimes it means that you don't, um, depending on what it is, you know, so that there can be some kind of if, if we have more insight into what it is that gives you these performance benefits, like which parts should you really try to cut out and which parts should you not really yeah. care if you have in? Um, unfortunately, it seems like the answer to that question is probably going to be something around security. Um, so like things like seccomp, uh, kernel page table isolation, things like this. Um, if you need to have those, those security domains within your guest, um, those are expensive. Yeah, and the other question is how uh, this uh, work actually can become some sort of project by itself, right? So uh, I think um, because Kata is its own project, but then it, uh, maybe kernel specialization would be like a, its own unique kind of kind of domain, right? So um, and then uh, I'm trying to see how this. This can be something separate from from Kata containers or Firecracker, right? So, uh, so that it has some 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 of its own, uh, you know, repository. So that can yeah. So it, it can become sort of a, a separate uh, project. Yeah. So I mean, if 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 people are interested, um, we do have uh, the things that we used. Oops. I don't know if you can still see it anymore. It went out of presentation mode, but we just yeah. do have uh, some of the stuff that we did for the uh, paper that we wrote. So a lot of these things that I'm talking about, like these scripts to run this stuff, a lot of the configurations, they are open source. But right now, we don't have anything kind of concrete to, uh, that, that we feel we can contribute to the community yet because it's like a, com a configuration here or there that we can't say for sure whether or not it's not going to break things. Um, is uh, it doesn't seem like it's quite there yet. So we're, we're working on trying to get a little bit more insight into this. Got it, yeah. That's great. So Eric has a comment here that says, uh, or a question, is Run C still used as a low level runtime? Um, I guess Run not. C? Run C, yeah. Uh, I don't, Run, Run NC? Uh, or are you talking about the Nova container one that? Like I, I, I think Run C. I don't know if Run C is. I mean, I'm guessing Docker does still, right? Isn't this still the default for Docker? Docker uses Run C, yeah. So, but uh, in in your case, I guess you, you're using uh, containers. Uh, you're pulling out container images, right? So yeah, yeah. So in in this case, in this case for this work, what we're doing is we're running the Firecracker directly. We're not we're not doing it through the uh, OCI or anything. Um, we're we're in the, what we are using the containers for is to pull out the images. So that's like a Docker's, uh, what is it? Uh, the one where you get the tarball of the image from the, from the Docker thing. I can't remember what the command's name is. Got it, yeah. Um, Docker. But we're not, we're not actually running them that way. In the stuff that, that is kind of ongoing where we're looking into the difference, but then we're running it with um, Cata containers, which um, has the Cata runtime as well as um, something called run Q, which is a kind of very, very, it run Q stands for run KMU in the same way as run C is run container, um, which is a, a kind of a more lightweight um, form of, uh, of, of virtualized containers. 
not as fully featured, but we're trying to understand the difference between running a full pod inside and not running a full pod inside. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's another comment from Eric here. It says uh, there was a project created to help profile syscall or syscalls uh, needed for seccom. It's a Red Hat, uh, I guess, container security seccom. So I guess uh, the Red Hat profiles. Uh, uh, yeah, right. I mean, there's a lot of there's been a lot of work where you know you have a kind of a learning phase where you run applications and you 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 s trace them and you figure out what they're doing and you know over a certain number of you know like I said a learning phase you you can start to develop a a second profile. Um, these things are. Um, I don't know. I, I guess to me, they always feel a little bit, a little bit like, you know, ah, like, you know, as it's only as good as your learning phase was as good. Um, you know, and I think because of that, I think that it, it, it leads, it leads most projects from, from what I can tell, it leads most projects to be not as strict about their set comp as they could be. Um, but, but yeah, that's definitely related for sure. Got it. Yeah, the other the other thing that uh, uh, just uh, I thought about is maybe this is a good fit for like a work group or something within the. So, uh, um, so a lot of the community members can collaborate and maybe come up with a better solution for isolation and also for um, for trimming down the Linux kernel within that isolation. So that's another. Yeah, is there a, is there like a general group that um, includes um, you know people from all of the all of the kind of isolation areas like um, like the CATA people and the GVisor people and there, there isn't right now. So that's I mean yeah. So that's that's just uh, yeah. That's something that I I thought about right. So yeah, the other the other thing that I think is like coming and I don't know well, when, but it seems like it'll be here before we know it is the um, once like things like uh, you know AMD SEV and um, I don't know I, I don't know if people are still working on putting these things into SGX and things like that. But once the kind of um, secure enclaves start really taking taking off, then a lot of the container isolation will start um, taking on a distinctly different flavor. Yeah. Um, so so. Get some, of the, some of the Intel folks and some of the um, uh, yeah, AMD, AMD, AMD people. Kind yeah, of. yeah. So, so it feels like that's like a, that. It feels like that's a train that's coming, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the Cata people are thinking about it. Um, but I was wondering if there was any groups that are kind of talking about that as well, because it seems very related as well. Yeah. Would you be interested in driving what some of this, some of this work on? Uh, so putting it together, or 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 someone, or you know, someone who might be interested in driving some of this work. Um, I don't know. I can ask. I can ask an IBM. I I probably don't have the um. I probably don't have the bandwidth at the time. Uh, at this time to kind of uh, drive some, some community stuff. But uh, I'll I'll ask an IBM. There might be some people. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, let's let's think up later. Maybe if you can. That'd be great. I mean, it, uh, because I think uh, there's a. Uh, there's lots of different work, uh, you know, but they're not quite related to Kubernetes and some of the, the cloud native community. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you can put that all together, all of that work together and then uh, make it, you know, some sort of project, like, like I was thinking, right. That it will be, you know, very useful. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. Um, Sounds good. All right. So I think we're over 10 minutes. So. And sorry, sorry for going over, you know, <laughs> and I saw it like a lot more. I was like, I was like, oh, we're going to keep talking about this stuff. But, but you know, um, no, is uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you to everybody for, uh, yeah. for listening. Let's keep in touch. Okay. Yeah, we'll do. You take right. it easy. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Stay safe. Thank you all.